area which I think we've sort of touched on throughout the day is sort of where government fits into all of this. And I think we're better to talk about that, particularly in the current climate, than around issues of national security. So I'm really pleased to be joined on the panel by Alex Van Sommeren, who is the Chief Scientific Advisor for National Security uh, to the MOD. He's responsible for giving independent scientific advice on national security uh, issues. He was previously a venture capital investor and entrepreneur focusing on investing in early stage deep technology startups. And his own scientific work is in the broad area of software engineering and, engineering and computer science. So I think you know, my own personal view is the, with your background uh, and being appointed to this role, I do wonder if that is quite a strong signal from government about how they see um, some of these um, issues developing within, uh, particularly in relation to deep tech and uh, venture capital and, and how we kind of bring these two worlds together a bit more. And then with, with him, we have Professor Deep Chana, who is Professor of Practice in the Imperial College Business School and co-director of the Institute for Security Science Technology and the Center for Financial Technology. Deep previously worked as a senior science and technology official within the UK government and is chair of the NATO advisory group on emerging and disruptive technologies. So I think we've got two people who can bring some really useful both sort of insights but also practical experience uh, to this discussion. So I wanted to open by asking you both kind of what frontier technologies you are actively looking to harness and what are the ways in which you think they are relevant to uh, national security. Let's start with you Alex. Thank you. Um, good afternoon everybody. So the list of technologies that we're interested in is probably the sort of buzzword bingo card that everybody has in their heads because the things that are at the cutting edge of technology are the things that we're responsible for trying to bring into government. So um, it's the usual suspects, artificial intelligence, uh, cyber security, um, engineering biology, uh, advanced semiconductors, quantum technologies. Um, and so, you know, really what we're trying to harness is some of the kinds of really cutting edge innovation that we've been discussing uh, during the course of today. And the fundamental purpose of the Chief Scientific Advisors Network is to help to do two things, to get government to make better decisions based on scientific evidence more of the time, and to get better access to cutting edge technologies and to ensure government gets the benefit from them. And so um, that, you know, both of those purposes are served by really understanding well what the emerging technology landscape looks like. Um, and by being uh, you know, open to the next uh, exciting technologies that maybe we haven't yet discerned quite so obviously that they've become uh, part of the buzzword bingo card. Great. Deep? Yeah, I mean, I think Alex has um, picked up on um, most of the ones that I would have, I would have mentioned as well. Um, but I think one, one of the things that we've just done recently actually with NATO is last year published an annual report on emerging and disruptive tech, which actually people can download. It's an open source document. And in there, we cover a few of these thematic areas that need to be kind of kept an eye on, if you like. Um, they're not meant to be exhaustive and we, sort of things that you could expect there are around data security um, and data transmission. We deliberately say that rather than cyber security because it's a bit more broad than that. Um, there's a whole section there around material sciences, AI and machine learning, of course, the emergence of um, various bits of quantum technology. Um, all of these things are worth you know, keeping an eye on and biotech, of course, as well. Um, and there are, you know, we could carry on with the list, but one of the, one of the other things I think that we highlighted there is that the, the fact that we are seeing a proliferation of human activity in space. Um, and this is very interesting because space effectively now is becoming the next major component of our global infrastructure. Um, and as this happens and we start seeing commercial systems going into space and these various technologies actually playing out in that space environment, all sorts of questions start being posed around you know, sovereignty up there and, uh, and ownership of assets and whether or not that, that domain should be militarized and whether it's a security domain and whether it's a dual purpose domain that has civilian and security purposes or it's just supposed to be a civilian space. Um, and so I think that's a very fascinating kind of stage, if you like, on which to view some of these technologies and to ask some very important scientific and geopolitical questions around security. And we sort of try to highlight that in, in that report. Great. I mean, you've picked up there, Deep, on sort of space as something which is warranting more attention or perhaps is something we don't talk about. It doesn't get added to that list as much when you sort of talk about the bingo card. Are there any other areas, Alex, that you think are sort of have been a little bit neglected or that you're particularly focused on from a national security perspective as something, an area of deep tech that we should be 
particularly interested in, in investing in or, or focused on? Um, we've covered the ground pretty well. Unfortunately, the, you sort of eventually get into the terrain of things where I'm not yet ready to talk about them in public. That's part of the point of the exercise, right? Um, but, you know, so we've, we've, we've talked there and, and Deep's added an important one, which I didn't mention. Um, you know, so um, these are all important areas. Um, I mean, we should not ignore um, the new distributed finance technologies, uh, which have some really interesting implications for the way the world is going to work in the future. And we've heard some speakers talking about those uh, earlier on uh, today. Um, and, and you know, th I think the jury is out on exactly when and how they will affect the way the, you know, the different parts of the world work, but they have geopolitical implications as well as purely kind of apparent day-to-day -day practical uh, implications. So. Um, that's a, you know, that's a sort of fertile area for exploration, I guess is how I would say it at the moment. Yeah. yeah, just to pick up on that, I think that's a great point. The, we were just talking about decentralized finance just before we came on here, and uh, I think that's going to be a, a very important thing to watch. And as Alex says, I mean, one of the things that that starts focusing your mind on when you start decentralizing those kind of things is, is actually people's connection to the nation state and this whole idea of web citizenship versus the kind of connection to a state, and then you start wondering about what role a state has to play in defending values and rights. Uh, and so actually it's interesting to see how some of the technology is really, really forcing us to reconsider some geopolitical structures and ways of, uh, ways of actually arranging the world, which of course we're seeing play out unfortunately at the moment. Great. I, we'll, I think we'll pick up on some of those points a, a bit later on. But earlier in the conference we've heard from a couple of different speakers. So I think we heard from Katie Ray about don't underestimate the role of government in deep tech ventures. And Kate then obviously took us through an example of how government might do this in the future, some, some lessons to be learned. So it'd be interesting to understand from your point of view how government can support frontier tech development. What role does it have to play through investment, through procurement, in other, in other, in other sort of levers it can be pulling to really encourage deep tech development in, in the future? Yeah. yeah. So um, I think there's a couple of um, it is fairly well publicized now developments along those lines. I mean, just to sort of set foundations, one challenge is that government probably uh, rarely represents enough of a customer in its own right to be fulfilling for companies' potential. And so generally one wants what are called dual-use technologies. One wants things where uh, there'll be a much wider market outside government, uh, and that way one significantly increases the likelihood that businesses will scale up to the point where they're uh, fulfilling their potential to use the term of art. So I think that's, um, you know, that's an important sort of foundation to lay. Having said that, um, it's very clear that government really is beginning to understand quite how much it can help by being both a customer and increasingly an investor. And um, to some extent, I, I, I'm, I guess, the personification of this because the idea that you'd recruit a chief scientist who isn't, you know, a proper professor, but who is, in fact, an entrepreneur and venture capitalist by tradition, you know, that's actually a really big signal, and it's intended to be a signal, as well as being about my arriving with some, you know, capability to try and help change this. So I was uh, able to participate in the establishment of something that my predecessor started, uh, Anthony Finkelstein, um, called the National Security Strategic Investment Fund. And so that is a dedicated venture capital style uh, investment fund designed to both equity invest, so buy stakes in businesses, and also to let um, purchase orders, work programs, um, to companies that provide technology that can be useful to national security purposes. And that mimics a program that's existed for uh, more than 20 years in the United States called Incutel. And it's intended to you know, help to demonstrate that the government really means to be a, a marquee customer and to help you know, ultimately to sort of pump prime those businesses. Because of course, government's pounds are not just important as pounds, they're important as an imprimatur, just in the same way they are in the NHS, as we were hearing in the previous panel, that it's an incredibly strong signal of confidence in a product or service in a business if government chooses to procure from them. So exploiting that, using that as leverage to help those uh, businesses then become more likely to be successful is important. And, and by the way, just to show that there is consistency in the system, the National Security Strategic Investment Fund only invests in dual-use companies. So invest in businesses that have government as a customer, but don't depend entirely on government's customer. Yeah, and these are really positive steps, right? Um, I think um, it's been a long time actually that, you know, certainly I've been involved in this space and advocating for, for, for actual direct investment in technologies and actually being a co-developer 
and a partner in the evolution of these technologies. And I think something like the, the NSIF was, was just mentioned is a really good step in that direction. Um, we've also here at Imperial, you know, we've been building this innovation ecosystem around defense and security for the last few years through the institute that I run. Um, and, you know, got to say that the Ministry of Defense through the Defense and Security Accelerator have got presence here on the campus and we have some uh, primes, uh, large corporates as well who are involved in that space also here. And the idea was to try and build a sort of ecosystem. Uh, my wife's a biologist, so she hates me using the word ecosystem and abusing it, but I will. Uh, we wanted to build this kind of ecosystem where actually, you know, startups can bump into people who can actually show them opportunities as well as, as, well as direct them towards finance and all of that sort of stuff. So that's the good stuff. Um, the not so good stuff, let's, let's look at that. There is still a long, long way to go for government to become technically literate enough to understand what is happening in this in the technology space is what I would say. So we have pockets of excellence within governmental organizations who kind of understand what might be happening in quantum, what, what machine learning and you know technologies are being developed. There are fewer people who then are able to take that and understand what that might mean for business, what that might mean for the economy, what wh where the opportunities are and where the hype is, that kind of stuff. So those are those sort of people are few and far between but generally speaking the overall technical literacy that we see across governmental organizations is really not where it should be and this has a massive problem when we talk about helping and you know creating processes and policies for innovation because of course if you do not understand those things then formulating regulation national policy around security defense or health or whatever it's going to be you're, you're already you're already on a losing wicket right and then the problem you have then is, you know, maybe then you go to get external people to come and ask you, but you don't really know who the trusted parties are who you can come to ask, you know, you can go to ask, um, and you don't know whether there's any bias in the advice that you're going to get. So again, you, you then end up in quite a, quite a horrible problem here of not being able to get yourself out of that, out of that sort of that trap. Um, and I think we still have quite a long way to go with that. Um, again, it's one of the things we've talked to NATO about, is that you can horizon scan the technology, we can create investment funds, and we're actually doing that through the NATO vehicle as well. But we desperately need to increase that level of technical literacy within the organizations. And we also need to secure the talent pipeline for the future. Because by the way, the kind of people that come out of Imperial College and the kind of people who come out with the sort of STEM qualifications are a very kind of special resource, which are going to be contest increasingly contested over. Um, and so something needs to be done to make sure that there is enough supply of that to enter into government, to enter into academia, into industry. And really it's for all those partners to kind of cooperate to try and make that happen. Yeah, and I mean, we spoke earlier, Alex, about what we can do at Imperial, I think, to kind of help with that pipeline and show perhaps some VAL graduates the, 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 uh, uh, some time spent in policy making in government as part of a career is actually time well spent. And I think. We've all got a lot of work to do in that space because I think, as you say, that talent pipeline is really important. It'd be nice uh, for some ministers to spend some time in the university. Well, that would also be good. Uh, but that's, yeah. that's, that's, we'll kind we'll of the, that's kind of the point I'm making. Is yeah. that it's great for our guys, you know, our people to go there, but I think some time spent from policy makers to come and actually understand some details of the science, but yeah. also the process of science innovation, right? That you know, quantum doesn't just pop out uh, in the last few years. I just did a thing this morning on quantum computing. It's very, very appealing for people to think, oh, it's just sort of emerged in the last couple of years. This is decades and decades of work, over, yeah. over 100 years of work probably that's led us to this point. Um, and so to understand some of those life cycles and some of those processes, I think is as important as understanding some of the technology underlying it as well. Yeah. I just want to pick up the point um, that you were making, Alex, around you know, this investing in dual use technologies and actually just try and understand, I think, particularly for this audience, sort of how, gov how, how that works in practice, how does government interact with the, sort of, with the commercial development? How does government development interact with the commercial development of some of these technologies? Well, um, the short answer is shockingly badly. And so that's one of the things that we're striving to change. And I think we heard um, very eloquently this morning, Dame Kate explained to us how, uh, on the other hand, uh, in a crisis, government proves to be very capable, with good help, uh, of moving much more effectively in uh, processes like procurement. And so the great question is, how shall we uh, try to change the system to enshrine the good behaviors that exist in a crisis in the system much more of the time? Um, but you know, the, an elaborate bureaucracy exists uh, with good intentions to uh, spend taxpayers' money wisely and to try to ensure that it isn't fleeced by uh, you know, uh, rapacious capitalists, and uh, actually 
Um, unfortunately, what that tends to do is make it incredibly difficult for small businesses to engage with it effectively. Um, so, you know, thresholds of turnover are set that say you can't bid unless you're large enough, and that automatically excludes all of the startups. Or, you know, <coughs> there's sort of capture of key resources that the large consultancies and primes managed to achieve over many years by cunningly refining um, their own systems specifically to make them more likely to succeed at bidding. And, and so all of that perversity uh, you know, somehow needs to be short-circuited. So one of the reasons that we established the model that we have in NSIF for procurement is that it essentially has a bypass on procurement processes for modest amounts of spending, and that enables us to you know, more or less tear off a purchase order off a pad, fill in a few boxes and you know, send it to the supplier. And that enables us to move quickly to get access to those technologies. But fundamentally, this is about a system having been put in place which is designed to police what are perceived as being risks. And of course, the fun part about that, if you come from the venture capital and entrepreneurial world, as I do and as people in this room represent, is that essentially we're all about taking on more or less as much risk as we can get our hands on and the system I'm describing is precisely the reciprocal that is designed to avoid as much risk as possible. And, and so that's the conundrum that I have the pleasure of looking forward to trying to solve. Did, did you want to come on in on that point? Yeah, it's, it's a really, um, so this mechanism of dual use has, has a number of benefits to it. The first is just been outlined just now. So um, over the last decade or so, I've been working with various startups trying to create innovative ideas for defense and security. And what you come up against, and this going back to my government days as well, you come up against a procurement cycle that works at around eight to 10 years, right? So you've got a massive problem there because you're not really going to see any sales or returns or revenue from your idea for about eight to 10 years. And if you get them in five, that's going at breakneck speed, right? So from the outset, you've got a little bit of a problem. So even if the idea is technically sound and there is potentially a use for it and a market and all that sort of stuff, if your customer is going to be government and going to be something like you know defense and security entity, then you've got to think of something else, right? And so dual use is a wonderful way of creating alternative revenue streams for those kind of startups so that they can think about their technical innovations in a modular sense. And this is one of the things we coach quite a lot, which is like build your technology in a very modular way so that it is composable to solve problems in other domains as well, where you might be able to get revenue so that that smooths out some of this risk. And of course, later downstream, we end up with a, a benefit for national security that is actually implemented. So that's, that's one reason for doing it. There's another reason for dual use, which again, we are advocating for internationally at the moment, um, which is again pertinent to some of the issues that are going on right now in the world. And that is that I, I genuinely believe there is a need for us to take a very different view of what defense and security is all about. So at the Institute, we talk about ensuring that science and technology investments are geared towards mitigating the circumstances of insecurity in the world so that we don't end up in wars, we don't end up in conflict in the first place. And if you look at a lot of the science and technology investment that defense focuses on in particular, but also security to some extent, the investments are effectively in the fail space, as I like to call it. So that means we're in the war and we're now developing science and technology to help us minimize our failure because getting to that point is not, is not really a, a victory, right? So there's a whole thing here around if we can invest in dual use technologies that can do things like solve issues in the sustainable development goal space, for example, we are effectively delivering against mitigation in the defense space. And this connection, this understanding doesn't really exist right now because we silo our concerns when we're talking about these different topics. And it's not a very useful thing to do. Um, and so this is, a, I think, dual use is one way of us moving away from that and moving towards what I like to call a more a sort of holistic vision of defense and security. Yeah. I mean, you're nodding, Alex. Is that something you're seeing or something you'd like to be seeing? I think this is a really important point to try to convey, that um, you know, defense and security isn't about things which are sort of pointy and green and blow people up exclusively. Actually, it turns out it's about pandemics and immigration and you know, actually what we really care about is both trying to ensure that we don't get into the condition of war, but also that we anticipate what some of the potential causes of uh, future conditions of war might be, and we try to actually, you know, having anticipated them, employ technology which allows us to diagnose the risks before we get there. So you know, I'm thinking about the... Um, uh, the uh, National Security Strategic Investment Fund has invested in a business which does 
machine learning on um, bills of lading in containers to allow you to understand when that particular container of bananas has a price on it which seems to be out of line with all the other containers of banana. You know, maybe it turns out it came from Colombia. Maybe you might want to look at it more carefully because it might turn out not to contain bananas. And you know, that, that kind of um, you know, analytics tool is, of course, actually it turns out just as interesting to hedge funds who want to know about the price of bananas uh, as it is to customs officers. So you know, those kinds of things are actually the sort of, if you like, the more soft edge of the national security spectrum, um, which turn out to be, have fantastic dual use applications, um, but which also essentially enable us to avoid getting into the, you know, the kind of, frankly, more expensive and more destructive and less pleasant you know, end of the business, which in the end, you know, people would really much rather avoid being in. Yeah, and I would just, I would just say that on the, in, the t in the deep tech environment as well, it's a bit easier to do because it also prevents you from overly specifying the solutions to the problem, which is another thing that you often see. You know, I would like a machine learning solution for X, Y, and Z, and that's not necessarily the right way of putting the requirement out there. So, you know, we can encourage people to say, well, I'd like to solve this problem. I'm not sure how to do it. And then let the, let the tech and the, the innovators kind of figure out what the best solution is uh, for that particular problem, and maybe even a, an associated problem, which we hadn't thought about in the first place. Sure. I mean, Another area that I think would be interesting to kind of discuss is around how you design a kind of a, a policy framework, a regulatory environment that encourages but also deals with some of these new technologies and particularly within a national security context. We want to support uh, the development of technology that helps the UK in the UK. We're pretty shameless about that. It doesn't mean we won't buy it from somewhere else. But it helps us in so many ways. If we support our own citizens, our own businesses, our own taxpayers, uh, and you know that allows us also to be much more comfortable about procuring goods and services from companies that conduct most of their business within the country. So actually, that's tremendously joined up. That's actually a great way to stimulate the economy to serve the needs that we have. And it also then brings in a different set of challenges about where shall the money come from, which does that? Where are we comfortable allowing the money to come from? Is all money to be treated equally when it invests in national security technologies? Um, and also, what happens if those companies want to trade outside the UK? And um, of course, we have some legislation which has recently been introduced, which uh, you know, tries to address uh, where the boundaries should be. The National Security and Investments Act is, is about trying to ensure that we don't just slip unnoticing into those kinds of businesses being controlled by undesirable uh, owners. And we also don't allow businesses to sell really good quality tech to just anyone. Um, and so you know, there is a balance. And that's not automatically comfortable. I mean, you know, to cut a long story short, entrepreneurs generally hate uh, any red tape that constrains their businesses. I, I get that. I, I've lived through it myself. But, but actually, there are really good reasons why this is important and worth uh, implementing well. And it turns out that, for those of you who've been watching closely, you haven't seen the newspapers fill up with stories about how Bayes is failing to process the applications under the National Security Investment Act, which a lot of people were anxious would be the case, actually. They seem to be doing rather an awesome job. So you know, it turns out that this stuff can be done well. It seems to be being done well. But that infrastructure being in place is important. Yeah, it's, it's very tricky, right? Because there are obviously some things when you look th through the security lens that you want to try and you know render safe and 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 have within the UK, and then that's kind of you know causing a pressure with also make, wanting to have startups and having your companies be successful on a global on a global stage. And how where, where's the right balance to strike? I, I will go back to what I said earlier on, though. First thing is you, it's good to have decision makers who understand that process of running a business and understand that the business of running a technology business in particular and what the pressures are in order to make these kind of policies. I think we're not quite at, at that point either, and that's a place for improvement. Um, one of the other, well, one of the results of that, I think, is that we see rather um, simplistic kind of policy making coming out in terms of you know, deciding, well, we're going to take this technology domain and it's going to suddenly become a, safe, a national asset, and maybe there's some way of putting our arms around it and holding it over here and, then, and, and drawing another line around there. And the reality is that science and technology development doesn't happen that way, right? I mean, at a university, it is a multifaceted, multinational activity that sort of bubbles up, and maybe you'll get some startups coming out, and they will form themselves, and then you know it, it goes on from there. So it's not that it's not that easy to just 
you know, create lines of demarcation around technology domains. And so when I've been asked this question before, the way I see that we need to solve this sort of problem, especially when you're thinking about investment from entities that you may not want to see investing in something or anything like that, is that you've got to be a better competitor. You've got to offer a different option for me as a CEO of a startup to take investment, let's say, in the UK, to stay in the UK, to grow in the UK, to be a unicorn in the UK. Those, that pathway has got to be the most elegant pathway that is open to me and not another one. And all too often, unfortunately, we are in a situation where after a certain point, our, our innovators are starting to look elsewhere for where they might you know, get investment and where they might be able to sort of grow and scale their, their companies up. And in that case, you know, it's, it's very, very difficult then to start putting policies in place to try and stop that from actually occurring. I mean, there is a scenario where, you know, you could create a, create a, create a company and decide you want to move the whole thing to another country. That happens a lot with, uh, with, with the US. Um, and short of stopping them from, from moving, which is a very difficult thing to do, I'm not, sure what you, I'm not sure what you would be able to do to intervene. I mean, that leads into my next question, really, which is what, how the UK stays competitive um, in, in, in with these technologies and developing these te technologies, and actually also uh, thinking about how, what role UK universities have to play in, in sort of being part of that sort of competitive environment. So it turns out we are actually really good at some things in, um, in particularly areas of technological innovation, and and so the first step is to be really good at some things and to you know not allow ourselves to tell ourselves that we're not. Uh, so I think we're actually world class in a number of these technological areas and therefore you know we start from a good place in terms of our ability. The next challenge is to provide the right supporting infrastructure. And we heard a lot of uh, I thought very good stuff earlier today about the challenges of the investment environment and about the differential between the UK and, uh, and Europe and the US and the seductive powers of the capital that's available particularly in the US and the valuations that are available particularly in the US and you know that really is a challenge because unless we have public markets that are equally liquid and equally well financed in the UK entrepreneurs and investors will understandably uh, want to go to the place where they can get the best deal so being competitive, as Deep put it, is, is absolutely the, the right solution there. And there's been a lot of work going on to try and change the way the environment works here. The public markets have been calcified for since the dot-com bubble, probably, 2000, um, partly because pension funds have actually been prevented from investing in high-risk assets. And that is now being changed. And you can read about it in the media right now. The regulations are being altered precisely to try and unstick that kind of thing. So I think that's, that's great progress. So we've got to provide that capital uh, support for those businesses. Um, but you know, ultimately, uh, we actually have a lot to offer as global suppliers in this. And of course, most of it flows from innovation that occurs originally or is supported in academia. And so continuing to support academia and continuing to support the collaborative nature of that, another really important thing Deep said, you, know, you, you can't do uh, research uh, in one country only. That's not even a meaningful thing. So you have to be able to allow the free movement of people and ideas. And unfortunately, you know, some of the things that have happened in the past few years have made the UK less attractive as a place for international collaboration in science and technology. And that's really terrible. And it needs to be reversed. And there is absolutely clear you know, direction of travel on trying to ensure that that is not allowed to get any worse. But unless and until we make those kind of changes, we will actually be tying one hand behind our back. And I think those of us who work in you know, anywhere close to academia completely understand that. And slowly that idea is starting to be understood more widely. Deep, do you want to come in on that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a slightly different tack because I think, I think that Alex has done a great job just explaining that, that aspect of it. I go back to the talent thing um, and the encour encouraging people to take on science and technology as a subject. I'm quite passionate about us going you know, pre-university and making sure that, that kids at school um, have, a, have a very early exposure to, you know, careers in science and technology, how multifaceted they can be, what a rewarding sort of career pathway it is. We suffer a little bit with science because, you know, there, doesn't, there, there isn't a kind of end job. As, you know, if you do law, you're going to become a lawyer potentially in, in, other, in people's minds, or if you, you do medicine, you're going to become a, become a doctor. And so I think people feel a bit of risk about getting involved in, 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 in science as they get to, you know, they go through higher education because maybe they're not entirely sure where they might land. So 
One of the things I think we're quite keen to do is to see if we can get into schools and um, illustrate people's pathways, career pathways. Uh, just tell people that this is my journey to where I got to today. It was a bit stochastic. It started off with this science stuff, and by the way, it was really cool to do. And I, and I think we really desperately need to do that because, again, if you look at the distribution of diversity uh, you know, in, in leadership positions, in science and technology companies, in universities, um, it's just not where it should be. I mean, it's, it's kind of woeful, actually, if you really look at it. And, and you can look at it from a sort of moral lens and say, well, actually, that's a, a bad place to be. But there's a very, very logical way to look at it, too, because why wouldn't we go and cast the net as wide as possible to find the talent wherever it's going to be? It's just not sensible to, do, you know, to not do that. And, and at the moment, we're not doing a great job of that. If we were able to do that, I think we could really harness the potential of the country and then power all those you know, industry, government, and academic sort of sectors that I was mentioning earlier, earlier on and secure them for the future. That's strategic to me, if, if we get that right. Great. Well, I think I might open up to questions from the floor now. Um, while we've, so we've still got a bit of time left. Just here. Grab the mic. So my question is around um, all these startup companies that we're talking about. We are a very open economy. But should we be thinking more about protecting sovereign capability? So one example is, for example, ARM that made um, lots of chipsets for every single mobile device in the world. We very casually sold it to SoftBank, I think it was. Uh, WS Atkins, another sort of defense type of organization being sold off. But with all these small companies that are producing all this innovation, should we really seriously be now thinking that, that actually we've got to protect and nurture them in the UK? I mean, graphene is a good example. I mean, I can have first stab at that. Yeah, I mean, those are great, those are great examples. And as you said, as those, as those stories played out, people suddenly thought, oh, well, we should have maybe done something to, to keep, these, um, keep these companies or keep this technology you know, within the UK. My view is that that's sort of bolting the door after the horse has kind of gone, right? Um, because because really what we should have been, been doing, as I said earlier on, is tracking that, understanding what that landscape was and recognizing that risk and actually p providing a better alternative. I, I do think it's very hard to put any policy in place that would actually prevent, as I said, a whole company just deciding it was going to decamp somewhere else. That's, another, that's one option. Um, the other thing is though, if you do try and do that, you also then potentially make the UK an unattractive place to come and do new business and new innovation. Because somebody thinks, well, actually, if this turns out to be a a national security type application tomorrow, I won't be allowed to go anywhere. So why would I come and set up here? So these are, these are the kind of things that I think we have to be careful of when we sort of consider those kind of policies. But Alex, sorry. So I think, um, if I may just be allowed to uh, correct the record, in, in fact, we were very thoughtful indeed about the transaction that you refer to where ARM was invested by SoftBank and actually uh, SoftBank were required to make a commitment to continue to provide a significant number of jobs in the UK. And, and so um, we shouldn't uh, uh, allow it to be suggested that these things are done thoughtlessly. They're not. Uh, but I think you're, the substance of your question is still you know, fundamentally sound, that this is a situation which, sadly, because of increasing sort of nationalist feeling all over the world, everyone is spending more time on, and which you know, probably deserves more attention. Distorting the market is a very dangerous thing to start doing. And so trying to avoid getting into a mindset which says, we're going to stop this sort of thing from happening, and instead think about how can we make the UK a more attractive place for people to keep building their businesses is surely the right way to try to help improve the situation, rather than you know, erecting barriers or uh, you know, requiring people to behave in a certain way. Um, because in the end, um, the, you know, it is unlikely that the government is going to be able to have all of the information it needs to make the best possible decisions every single time on what will be an increasing number of those kinds of questions. Um, and on the other hand, you know, we want to make sure that we do protect and nurture the assets that we ha have developed in this country. So I think that there is an increasingly adept system for trying to make those kinds of decisions well. And, you know, actually, in the past, you know, there has been quite a lot of attention paid to these kinds of situations. But you will certainly be hearing more about these sorts of challenges because, yes, um, we want to make sure that, you know, we get the benefit from the things that we've helped to pay to create 
and that mines in this country have you know, created. And uh, I, don't, I think that's a, that's a perfectly reasonable thing. But that doesn't mean we don't want to share them with other people. It doesn't mean we aren't willing to have other people invest in them. It doesn't mean we aren't willing to have them as customers. We just want to get the balance right in favor of the UK, you know, getting the best possible opportunity. Uh, yeah, it's a tricky there. balance. Hi, is that working? Yeah. Um, it's interesting. So the, the panel today was talking about the sort of the disconnect between government and STEM educated people. Um, this panel's wrote, talked about it, and, and Dame Kate spoke about it this morning as well. The question that comes to my mind is: Is it the fact that STEM educated people are just not interested in going into government, or is it the government are not interested in dealing with STEM people? And I wonder whether anybody had any thoughts on that. I mean, I can I can tell you from a bit of experience. Um, obviously, having spent some time in the government and tried to promote STEM skills, and I'm sure Alex has, has got a view as well on this. Um, there are two problems there, and, and you, you hit on both of them really. One is that I think it's a bit, it's a bit difficult for people outside of government to fully understand what they can do, what role they can play, what impact they can make if they have a, a STEM background. Um, you're very quickly streamed off into a into techie world. You know, you're you're the you're the techie and then there's a whole bunch of policy people and then you don't do the policy you do, you're going to do the technology so so I think from the outside that's what it looks like but in reality that's not the truth in reality there are many many different things that can happen and a role to play for someone with stem skills inside government all over all over the place that so so I think having a greater level of transparency of what how government works is would, would sort of help to solve the problem there there is another problem though inside government and that is this techie culture thing which is actually that you, you, you take care not to reveal, I mean certainly when I was in government you would take care not to reveal that you had a PhD in physics or you had, a, you had an engineering degree or you were, you were numerically inclined because you were automatically then you know labelled as being this technologist or this scientist Can person. you fix my computer? Yeah, can you, you know, you're, IT, or, you're always an IT support right once you've done something like that so that's, that, that, that's, that's, that's true. Yeah, and, it, and you, do, you, do, you do see that happen and suddenly you're not really, you're not necessarily being given an opportunity or a voice inside something like, you know, a policy debate on geopolitics, for example, because apparently that's not your kind of wheelhouse, that's not your skill set. Um, and so there needs to be a bit of education then internally about the fact that a science education gives you possibly the most flexible, I think, ability to kind of, you know, deploy yourself into different places. Um, and with those two things, and maybe the situation sort of, you know, we can improve them. Uh, and then there's another problem, which is that te the technology industry is doing an awesome job of soaking up all of the talent yeah. at great levels of reward. And the civil service is configured to try and use taxpayers' money wisely, which is to say that it doesn't pay people the same as they can get paid if they go and work for Google. And so we're really struggling to recruit high quality tech talent in the face of great financial adversity um, from well-funded international tech majors. Um, but it turns out that, not picking on any company in particular, you know, going and working for a tech major may not always be as much fun as it looked. And actually all that money may not compensate for not feeling like you're doing something that's really useful and worthwhile. And actually, you can actually achieve great things by helping out in government and, and actually the need for those technology skills is real. So I'll be working from the inside to try and make sure that such people can get paid better and I'll be hoping to evangelize the opportunity as a really exciting and worthwhile one for people to come participate in. And you know, maybe that will attract a few more people and we will make progress in redressing that balance. And you, and you know, another lever there is just the impact that people can have very, very quickly can be involved in something of, at a global scale and that can sort of offset that, you know, maybe you're never going to be able to pay as much as, you know, one of the big tech giants, but you can offset that by the impact and the interest of the work. And also, actually, there's cultural reform needed. You know, we need more agile, easy working environments in government that are a little bit less stuffy. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, now, I now go back and I sit in some of these rooms and I, and I honestly, I'm grateful to leave an hour later <laughs> because it's, <laughs> it's, it's so stifling. And I think, you know, any, any person coming out of a, a graduate program with us who would spend an hour in that situation, that would not be a great advert for wanting to come and work in that organization. And I, and I, don't, think that our, I don't think people necessarily just go for the salary. I mean, I agree that is a, that is a motivator, but interest and a nice place to work yeah. is, is just as valuable. Absolutely. I think we've got time for one more question, if anyone. I think the gentleman over there had his hand up. 
Uh, first of all, may I thank uh, Dean Veloso, the, sp the speaker panels. You have done a fabulous job, and it's been a v wonderful experience to, to be here today. My uh, short question for you is, when you look at the war in Ukraine, do you, see, uh, do you think that deep tech is taking a big role in that war, or is it a pure conventional war? Okay, I'm, I'm, ha I'm happy to go first. I mean, I, th I think this definition, this idea of what we call um, deep tech is, um, I mean, it's a nice phrase, right? But I mean, there's always some kind of deep and detailed technology, whichever point of history you look at. So you are looking, you're looking at a, you're looking at a conflict which is utilizing many technologies which, you know, you'd have considered to be cutting edge five or ten years ago. I guess you'd have thought those would be sort of deep tech domains. There certainly is, I think, a lot of, um, technology being deployed. I mean, the kind of things that, you know, look at things that be, like drone technologies, the kind of reconnaissance that's being done, the, you know, the intelligence stuff that's being done too. But there's another aspect to this too, which is that commercial technologies, if you like, things like social media and data technologies, which are just being used by civilians, are playing an enormous role in this. And that's probably something which you could have kind of predicted, but maybe not to the scale uh, th that we're seeing inside, inside this particular conflict. W one thing is true that conflicts such as this will definitely motivate a re-examination and a focus on our current deep tech programs and projects. And people will start wondering about what they do now with those things in terms of security and defense. How should they pursue them? Uh, you know, some might argue that it's time for a deep tech race, you know, a kind of space race, an arms race type thing. Uh, I don't think that's a particularly great idea, um, but it is out there right now. It, you know, these, this is thing, these are things that people are talking about right now. Um, and others would advocate that actually we can't go into that because that's a far too dangerous a proposition and we have to be more inventive about how we are now going to pursue this, uh, these technologies for defense and security. And we talked about dual use, et cetera, as being one pathway. But um, sorry, Alex, I'll leave the last word for you. I think that, um, in fact, in a very unusual development today, your question has been answered by the director of GCHQ, mm -hmm. who has announced that President Putin isn't receiving accurate information from the front line uh, about what's going on in the war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we will, uh, we'll, call, we'll call it that.